Hello, my name is Henk de Berg. I'm a professor at the University of Sheffield and one of the two directors of the Pokhoff Center. I'm here in Sheffield Cathedral to interview the British philosopher John Gray. John Gray, welcome to the Pokhoff Center and to Sheffield Cathedral. Thank you very much, Henk. I'm very glad to be with you in conversation in the Cathedral in Sheffield. I want to talk about two things in this interview. First of all, about the question, does God exist? Or perhaps rather the question, what does it mean to be a believer or an atheist? And then in the second part of the interview, I want to talk about the rise of populism and the strong man in contemporary politics. Let's start with questions of religion. We all know that there are different religions. There's Christianity, um, uh, Islam, uh, and, and so on. Then there are different denominations and uh, versions, as it were, within those uh, religions. We know that there's uh, a religion, if that's the right word, like Buddhism, where there's no concept of God and there's no concept of the soul. We know that in Norse mytho mythology, the gods are mortal and actually die. So we know about uh, what the philosopher William James has called the varieties of religious experience. We don't seem to look in the same way at atheism. We don't really know about the varieties of atheist experience. You've written a book about this, which is called Seven Types of Atheism. Yes. Uh, can we talk about the title first? Because the title refers to another book, does it not? The title of my book, Seven Types of Atheism, refers to a book by the 20, 20th century English uh, literary critic uh, and poet, William Empson, who wrote a book called Seven Types of Ambiguity. And Empson's uh, book, I think, is a a great book, a very interesting book, uh, because he argues there really independently of anything that was going on in philosophy in the 20th century, for example, Wittgenstein and other writers, uh, other philosophers who've uh, uh, made advances in the philosophy of language. Uh, Empson argues that the ambiguity of language is essential to its uses. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, he says we shouldn't aim for, in language, for precision because the world, the human world, isn't precise. It's not captured in fixed kinds of things. It's plural, it's ambiguous, it's sometimes apparently contradictory. And he applies this analysis of language, particularly to poetry. He said there couldn't be poetry uh, if it wasn't for the ambiguities of language. <clears throat> now, reading that book, it occurred to me that the same thing applied to religion and also to atheism. When we talk of religion, we think we know what we mean. Um, we have a particular idea of religion which we inherit uh, from um, Christian uh, monotheism primarily. And whatever our view of monotheism, we, grew up, we all have grown up, most of us in Britain, even many immigrants have grown up in a society which has been shaped by monotheistic uh, ideas. Um, so we tend to think of religion um, in terms of uh, monotheism, and we also, I think, tend to think of atheism uh, in monotheistic terms. But if you look at the longer history of uh, uh, atheism, the type of atheism that we have today, which is what I would call a sort of evangelical unbelief, um, carries over many of the central conceptions and premises and assumptions of uh, monotheism. It may invert them, it may reject them, but actually the category of thinking, the ways of thinking about um, the human subject, humankind, and the relations of human beings to the world, are in many instances, I would say, actually mostly, uh, um, reproductions or renewals or reiterations, if you like, of those in monotheism. But in the longer term history of atheism, and even in the atheism of the, 19th, of the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, there are, there are other atheisms uh, which are clearly uh, varieties or types of, of atheism, but which differ sometimes quite profoundly from the predominant type of atheism uh, that we're all uh, uh, accustomed to today. So let, let, maybe let's start with that particular... So atheism is like religion in being plural and fluid and sometimes seemingly contradictory. 
Yeah, Let, let's start with a more simple, or perhaps one should say simplistic version of atheism, uh, which is, I guess, what uh, today is called new atheism, represented by people such as Richard Dawkins. Mm. Uh, you start your book with that type of atheism mm. as well. You're very critical of it, aren't you? I am, but very briefly, because I seriously considered, and I was even encouraged by people who knew I was writing the book not to talk about the new atheism at all. And the reason I seriously considered that possibility is that there's nothing new in it, actually, and nothing which is very interesting in my view. In fact, it's less intellectually um, rigorous and um, interesting than the atheisms it's modeled on, which are essentially 19th century atheisms. But I decided that I would consider and, uh, the new atheism, mainly because when most of the potential, nearly all of the potential readers of the book, when you ask them about what atheism, they would think of Dawkins and yeah. perhaps of, if they were American or interested in philosophy, of Daniel Dennett and mm -hmm. possibly uh, and, and, and Sam Harris Sam and others Harris, yes. who are called, who are de commonly described as the um, uh, among the principal new atheists. So I did. So I'm very critical of it, and <clears throat> as you rightly say, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is that it, it does unwittingly, I think, uh, the new atheism um, carry over many of the assumptions and concepts of monotheism without criticizing them. I mean, one of the, not only of monotheism, but even of a particular narrow, restricted area of monotheism. So uh, um, the new atheists think of religion principally uh, in, uh, 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 and, and theism, uh, they often identify the two as being to do with belief. So they think that practitioners of religions have normally had a, a set or even a list of beliefs which they assert. Uh, and that's what religion is about. Uh, uh, and that's connected with the second view of theirs, a second idea of, some of the new atheists, which is that religion is actually a primitive form of science. So that uh, people who, are in, who hold to a religion or practice a religion according to these new atheists, um, subscribe to a variety of a list, a system of propositions about the world, that's their religion. And those propositions are essentially um, primitive forms of what later became a scientific theory. So actually they think of religion as an, a primitive theory. And that's a very um, uh, familiar idea if you know anything about the 19th century history of ideas in Europe, in Europe, particularly in France and England, because if you go back to um, the 1840s and a little bit earlier, and then on towards the end of the 19th century, you find whole schools of thought who say, uh, particularly what are just called the French positivists, mm -hmm. Saint-Simon and Auguste Comte, tremendously influential, not only among thinkers and writers like um, uh, and philosophers John Stuart Mill, George Eliot, the uh, novelists and so on, they were tremendously influenced by, by Comte, but also engineers, the engineers who built the um, Panama Canal were positivists, spread all over the world, Vietnam, Brazil. Uh, Britain had, had temples in London and Liverpool, for example. Mm. Um, but and Comte, of course, is seen as the father of sociology, or positivist yes, sociology. In, yes, in, I think he invented the word. Um, Comte, the father of sociology and social science, and what Comte said was, following on from Saint-Simon, Human thought has three stages of development. There's um, uh, magic, which he identifies with religion. There's metaphysics, which is philosophy. Then there's the highest stage, the one he thought he was in, uh, and Europe was in or entering, which is science. And of course, as each stage renders the previous two stages um, redundant. And there was a famous book, which can still be found in very inexpensive editions in discount bookshops. Uh, called uh, The Golden Bough by J.G. Fraser, um, a British writer, it's sold countless, um, um, I mean millions I think, hundreds of thousands certainly, of copies in the late 19th, early 20th century. And it's a study of the world's mythologies, uh, a, a list of the world's mythologies, a compendium of the world's mythologies, based on that idea. So it says, well, this is what savages, that's what Fraser calls traditional peoples, indigenous peoples, savages. This is what they think, these are their beliefs, these are their theories, but of course they're ridiculous. When they say there's a voice in the tree, it's just a silly when they, uh, theory. When they say that uh, uh, the thunder god creates th th thunder and lightning, 
now we have a better explanation, which is science, but they're primitive. And I think the best comment on that which was ever made was by Wittgenstein, the 20th century Cambridge um, philosopher, who said, um, um, Fraser's more savage than the savages he analyzes. I think it's a brilliant comment, because it's a very primitive idea of culture and of um, what so-called primitive societies are doing, and of um, religion uh, um, uh, as well. So, but although I'm almost certain in the, that none of the new atheists has ever read Comte, I've never seen any reference to Comte, he's never me mentioned by name anywhere, that positivist view that religion is primitive science, and now that we've got better science, we don't need religion, um, that is that, essentially a 19th century view, as you say, isn't it? It's a 19th century view. Which can be found in thinkers such as Ludwig Feuerbach, yes. uh, also in Sigmund Freud. Uh, yeah. Freud famously wrote a book called The Future of an Illusion. That's right. The illusion being religion, and the future Very good example. Ba basically Freud. meaning... At least the early uh, Freud. Sorry? At least the earlier Freud. Uh, Just, yeah, so the idea being, you know, th this illusion has no future. Yeah. Uh, to which uh, it might have been useful in the past when the human mind was primitive. Th 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 that's right. Now that it's, the human mind isn't primitive anymore, it's not only useless; it's harmful. It's a stage we've left behind, yeah, and we must leave it fully behind. Yeah. Because if we don't, we'll be um, we'll, we'll we'll just sink into a mire of superstition. And, uh, and the interesting thing about that is, of course, is that it hasn't happened. Freud's book came out in 1927, yeah. already in 1928. I'm sure it was you later know this. Than I thought, yes. Is is uh, um, uh, his friend, who was also a psychoanalyst, but also a Protestant pastor, Oscar Pfister, yes. wrote a book, The Illusion of a Future, yes. saying, you know, this is a very yeah. problematic view of yes. human nature and actually a view that goes against yes. the general thrust of psychoanalysis, yes. which stresses the permanence and hu human finitude and yes. the fallibility. Uh, so and maybe relative constancy. And doesn't change much. So the idea being that maybe religion isn't such a bad thing to have. Um, so if new atheism is yes. basically a revival of, uh, perhaps even a, uh, arguably a more simplistic revival of 19th century mm. uh, uh, theories, the second type of atheism you look at is secular humanism. It is. But let me make a comment on yes. Freud first, because I think actually taking up your very interesting Freud reference, um, Freud argued, um, and this is why his thought was scandalous when it w was first propagated in the um, turn of the century Vienna, that uh, sexuality was pervasive in human life uh, um, and that attempts to abolish it or censor it resulted in perverse and bizarre forms of sexuality. So sexuality was uh, not something that only appeared in grown up people, it was there when a, an infant was born, it was all the way through and you couldn't repress it. My view of religion is similar to Freud's view of sex. Um, religion, in the sense we can dis discuss, I mean, religion isn't monotheism, it's not even theism, we can discuss what it is, maybe later in our conversation, but religion is as ubiquitous in the human animal as sexuality is, and attempts to um, surpass it, transcend it, leave it behind, or worse still, prohibit it or ban it or censor it, um, have the same results that Freud said repression of sexuality had. That's to say it comes out in bizarre, hysterical, hidden or uh, uh, obscure forms. And so uh, that's it. Now, that second, that view that I've just described is part of um, the second type of atheism I discussed, secular humanism. And I guess when we began our conversation, you, I, I, you mentioned the question, God exist, does God exist? I mean, I think a better question for a, a free thinker nowadays is does humanity exist? Because what the uh, secular humanists, some of them liberal like John Stuart Mill, he said he accepted August Comte's religion of humanity. And he also said, by the way, he said it's a, it's a better religion than any religion that has ever existed before. So he definitely, often secular humanists say, we don't think of secular humanism really. We never thought that well. He did. One of the founders of liberal humanism in Europe, he said it was a religion and it was a better religion than any traditional religion had ever been. So it was a religion for him. And uh, what the sort of common feature of types of secular humanism, whether they be liberal like Mills or non-liberal like Marx's or Nietzsche, I would think of also as a secular humanist actually, or Bakunin, or uh, even some of the sort of semi-fascist thinkers who were in yet another way uh, humanists, is that um, 
uh, they think of the human species as a collective moral agent now. Uh, in other words, the human species has some of the characteristics, many of the characteristics, in fact, that uh, the monotheistic God did. In fact, Comte said, the supreme being henceforth is humanity. Uh, and why this is important is that if you go back into um, the history of uh, thought and particularly of religion before uh, Christianity in Europe, when it was predominantly um, polytheistic, uh, there was no conception of humanity as a collective agent doing things throughout its history. There might be some idea, as there was in Aristotle and later in the Stoics, that humans had certain common characteristics and that they had a common problem of adapting to the world or they had a common nature they had to uh, develop. Although, as we know in Aristotle and many of these writers, um, many of these thinkers, they uh, also thought that human capacities for, were very uh, unequal as between Greeks and non-Greeks, males and females, free persons and slaves and so on, but put that aside for the moment. Um, but they didn't have the idea that humankind, the human species, was collectively realizing a common story throughout history. They just didn't have that idea. It's not in Homer, it's not in the ancient historians. It isn't anywhere. Um, it comes from, uh, any more than it is, by the way, in ancient China or ancient India or ancient Japan. It's uh, a monotheistic idea. And uh, the secular humanists inherited that idea. So when they say, we will achieve this, as um, Dawkins at the end of his book, The Selfish Gene, says, well, we're gene machines, we're mechanical systems. He said, but we can rebel against that. Now, how, if we're really mechanical? Now, it might just be an illusion that we have, <coughs> that we're rebelling against. But who is it who does the rebelling? <clears throat> what is it that does the rebelling? There's no humanity. There's no, con there's no collective agency there in Darwin's theory. Um, there's just a mechanical process. Um, so um, that's a kind of key element that secular humanists, be they liberals or not non-liberals, have um, unwittingly, unthinkingly, unreflectively transferred from um, monotheism into, into secular humanism. And that's connected with ideas of progress, ideas of, um, in which history is um, not just universal, I mean, because humanist history is like monotheistic history, it's the history of the whole species, um, but it's also redemptive in a certain way, which is that even though there may be no improvement in history, which is strictly inevitable, even though there may be periods of regression, uh, um, um, history is nonetheless conceived as a, a continuing drama in which um, the species as a whole struggles to achieve its possibilities, to, to, to achieve, to realize its nature. And that again is different from even from Aristotle and certainly from the ancient historians because they, they con continuously write of history in, as if it's similar to or even the same as in some deep sense with um, the seasons, with biological phenomena. So they talk about the rise of civilizations, they reach a peak, they, they reach a kind of summer um, which oh, many of their, all their, their, their best achievements, they're, they're at peace, they have high arts and learning, they're wealthy, uh, they have leisure, they have all these goods, and then they begin to decay. They get into an autumn and a winter, and then they die, often, and a new civilization comes up later. That naturalistic conception, that conception of uh, history in terms of a variety of civilizations or ways of life, rising and falling, improving, getting better, getting stronger, getting higher, then sinking and dying and disappearing, is not the conception of history which then prevailed in uh, monotheistic um, uh, Europe and monotheistic traditions all over the world, and which it's not the conception which has been carried on now uh, within secular humanism. Indeed, if you put it to a secular humanist, they very often say, if I believed that, I would despair. Well, Homer didn't despair. Machiavelli, who revived that conception, didn't despair. Uh, all the people those of the ancient Rome, Tacitus, the, the historians, they, they didn't despair. For them, it was, for them, it was, if you like, their natural view of things, their normal view of things. So there are two things that change. God, as it were, 
becomes, as it were, replaced by the collective subject that is humanity. Yes. And history is no the longer. So uh, the, is no the better longer question is not does God exist? It's, I mean, nowadays, it is, does humanity exist? Yeah. And the answer is we can know humanity does not. We actually know. We can't know that. God doesn't exist. We can know that humanity doesn't exist because what we find before us in our empirical observations is the multifarious uh, human animal in all its diversity and uh, conflicts with different ways of life, different languages, different religions. We and secular humanism it. tries to do away with that by then also changing the concept of history so that yes. history is no longer cyclical but becomes linear and if there isn't yeah. some sort of goal, if there isn't a telos, there is at least sort of an upward tra trajectory and yes. things are getting better and better. And you're saying that is essentially kind of still a religious illusion, yeah. is that right? it's a monotheistic hangover. I mean, things are getting better and better, or at any rate, they're getting more and more human. Because at the back of this is an idea which you... Uh, I mean, there was a very complex interaction within Christianity uh, uh, between the um, Hebraic Jewish traditions and the Greek or Platonistic traditions. So an idea grew up, which I don't think was at all in the original teaching of Jesus, that... Um, uh, humans had immortal souls and they had a kind of essence which they all had in common, which God had given them. And in many, in, and in later thinkers, um, including thinkers who described themselves and understood themselves as atheists like Karl Marx, uh, an idea of history, and before Marx, Feuerbach, who you mentioned earlier, an idea grew up that human history was the realization of the human essence. So if you say, in what sense is history getting better? Uh, the answer is it, um, humans are becoming more and more human. Um, the human species as a whole is becoming more what it essentially is. Now, of course, if you're a, uh, if, if you are, let's what's something called an empiricist, that's to say you, you try as much as possible, or a pragmatist like William James, he mentioned earlier too, you, um, uh, you try as much as possible to stick to uh, observable um, uh, um, data, observable facts, what you find is never the human essence. You never find the human species trying to become more itself. What you find are lots and lots of different human beings. Um, every single one of them internally multiple in various ways with conflicting desires, emotions, needs, uh, values, and so on. Living their various lives, creating various forms of life, ways of life, which interpenetrate and interact with each other, but which are also quite different from each other. In other words, if you stick to that, what you don't find is humanity. Humanity is a kind of, well, what I say in, in my book is, humanity is the deus absconditus of modern atheism. That's to say, the deus absconditus in theology is God who's vanished absent. from the world and yeah. absent. And humanity is the absent God of modern secular humanism. It's not there. And so that, and it's, if you like, it's the horror, the almost metaphysical horror that atheists, modern atheists feel when they find no humanity in the world that leads them to create these complex constructions regarding history and a kind of hidden humanity. And this is also found not just in Marxists, but also in liberals too. Mm. One, one of the means that, uh, that are then employed in order to make that more plausible is science, mm. which I think brings us to mm. scientific, or maybe what you say so-called, I don't know, yes. scientific atheism, yes. Yes. where one tries to underpin not just atheism, but also that sort of slow piecemeal meal success story mm. through science, which you can find, for example, uh, in Stephen Pinker's recent yes. book, uh, Enlightenment uh, Now. You can also find it, of course, in Bolshevism. Very much uh, so. And you've written a, a really interesting book about that, which <laughs> is called The Immortalization yes. uh, Commission, where you talk about uh, people embalming Lenin in the hope, I think... Well, uh, before they embalmed him, they froze him. Yeah, and no, uh, neither of them worked. Uh, in the hope that then at some yeah. stage science would have progressed so far that it could bring, bring, him, back. bring him back to life. Yeah. Um, so, so there is, we, we've now looked at three versions of atheism, new atheism, secular humanism and scientific atheism. Well, the key, the key feature, uh, a couple of key features of scientific uh, atheism, uh, which turned into a succession of cults, or religions of science, sometimes quite explicit, by the way. Um, there was one at the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century in Central Europe, called monism, which was described as a scientific religion by its founder, Ernst Haeckel, who was a 
pseudo-Darwinian biologist who also believed in racial hierarchies and uh, was very hostile to Christianity and also to Judaism and um, um, wanted, to, wanted to develop and did in fact develop, it was very popular up to the First World War among <clears throat> intellectuals in Central and Eastern Europe and Germany, a religion um, of science and in Britain there was Julian Huxley who talked about evolutionary humanism which was a kind of he thought scientific version it was it was a, a kind of um, a scientific a religion of science founded on 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 Darwinism, um, and I guess the key idea there is that uh, the, the key thought that these um, pro projectors these these figures who want, who've developed different religions of science is that since science does progress which I think it does too. That's to say, I believe that there is cumulative advance in human knowledge. I am not a postmodernist or a radical relativist in that sense. I think um, uh, the reason that there are seven or how many there are billion human beings in the world now uh, is that the spin-offs from the growth of human knowledge have enabled such a large population to, to develop. If it wasn't for public health or intensive agriculture or other technologies which are based in the growth of knowledge. There wouldn't be seven billion human beings in the world. Um, so, um, but the, the, the inference they make is to my mind a profound error, which has been criticized in, been understood as being an error all the way back to Hesiod in Greek thought, which is that they, they reason that because um, uh, science advances, there is progress in science in the sense, not just of improvement followed by decline, which is the secular view, but progress in the sense of accumulative advance. That's what's been in, uh, gained in the previous phase is not never wholly lost or rejected. It gets absorbed into the next phase so that the growth of knowledge is, is a, 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 a cumulative uh, process. They think that because that's true in science and technology, that it can be true or even is true in ethics and politics. So they think that uh, along with the advance of human knowledge and of science and technology, there's a parallel advance in civilization. And I think that's pretty well wholly false because um, for a variety of reasons, um, human reasonableness, let's call it, doesn't uh, advance uh, when human knowledge advances. I mean, you could even say that, uh, I mean, if, uh, if the, this theory of um, uh, human rationality being embodied in science and in civilization, if it was a scientific theory itself, it would have long been falsified because many of the atrocities of the 20th century were possible only by using new technologies yeah. like the yeah. telegraph or in the case of the Holocaust, the filing systems to track people down. Uh, there'd been pogroms throughout Christian history, but they hadn't been able to or hadn't tried to track down the very last Jewish person on the continent and kill them, as did in fact, was in fact attempted. The Nazis tried to find out the last Jewish person in Norway, they believed, tracked that person down in order to kill him or her. And um, that hadn't happened before. So human, if you like, human ambitions, in this case hideous ambitions, genocidal ambitions, expand certainly with the growth of knowledge, the growth of human power, the growth of human technology, the advance of it. But there are often uh, expanded versions of hideous or bad or uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, values or ambitions that had existed before. So I see no connection, actually, no systematic connection between the advance of human knowledge and of technology and, if you like, improvement in civilization. That's partly yeah. because humans don't really change, but it's also because the expansion of human power that goes with uh, uh, is harder and harder for flawed humanity to deal with. They're capable of committing greater crimes, greater evils. Mm -hmm. It's harder for human beings, I'm not talking about humanity as a species, but just harder for groups of human beings or individual human beings to restrain themselves when they have more and more power at their disposal. Yes. And yet the belief in science is extraordinary and, and, yes. and very very pervasive and very long-lasting. Yes. I mean, if you look at Ernst Haeckel, whom you mentioned, who wrote a book, Die Welträtsel, mm -hmm. The World Riddles, which is actually, uh, as you know, a response to a book written earlier mm -hmm. by someone called Emile Dubois-Raymond, mm -hmm. who had written a book called Die Sieben Welträtsel, The Seven 
riddles of the world, and then he said, well, these are things that we can't answer. In a famous, uh, mm. uh, famous lecture, Emile, uh, the, uh, the, the last word of a famous lecture by Emile dubois Raymond is ignorabimus, ignorabimus, we will never know yes. this stuff. And then Eccles, Heckel says, no, actually, science, my most already has, science, already has, has yes. advanced yes. to such a degree that we can now answer these questions. That book was and published then, in English, and, and the Heidel book, by the Rationalist Press Association in yeah. London. It's full of racism, of course. What I wanted to say is, uh, you find the same belief in um, um, in Richard Dawkins. The final yes. sentences of Richard Dawkins's book are something along the lines of, "I'm thrilled to live in an age <laughs> uh, where uh, humanity is pushing against the limits of science." What is more, we may find that there are no limits yeah. to human understanding, uh, which is an extraordinary thing to, to say. To, to say. The, the question I want to ask is, if you look at the new atheism mm -hmm. and then secular humanism and scientific atheism, mm -hmm. which you deal with as three different types of atheism, are they not all actually kind of the same? Um, of the five of the seven that I discuss, five of them I think have common characteristics, uh, which they take uh, from monotheism. Uh, I mean, um, a writer like, I think, a like Comte was actually very clear that when he talked about atheism, he meant a project of collective human self deification. So, what is, and that relied, of course, upon the Christian God. By the way, later on in Russia in the 19th century, Dostoevsky wrote a wonderful comic novel called um, Demons or the Devils or the Possessed in different translations, mm. which is largely about that. Uh, Dostoevsky says ath atheism of the kind he used to subscribe to himself when he was a young man and then rejected after going to jail and being exiled in Siberia is a project of self-deification. So I see that um, project recurring all the way up to uh, Dawkins as you do and also by the way in the um, project of conquering death which you referred to mm. in my book. Uh, um, uh, the Immortalization Commission, which is partly about the Bolsheviks, because if there's one feature of hu human life which reminds us that we're not gods, at least as we've considered, conceived God, is that we are mortal. Is that we all die. We don't die by accident, we die in a sense of necessity. We're mortal beings, we're finite, we die. And uh, indeed, the whole species may die. But it's against that. In fact, if, if the future of evolution is anything like the past of evolution, it will become extinct. All the previous ones have, species have, over time. Um, so, and that, of course, is a tremendous um, uh, insult, if you like, to this kind of religion of science, because um, the practitioners of it want, as Dawkins evidently does in the last paragraph, the last sentence, as you've quoted from um, the uh, selfish gene, he wants the human mind to be potentially infinite in the way that the mind of God was infinite mm, mm. in theism. Now, if you started from a, the opposite end and you, you thought of humans actually as Darwinian theory thinks of them, as animals like other animals, as Darwin himself, who wrote a book on the, the emotions of animals, thought of them much of the time, you would, you would say that, well, humans can't have a godlike mind, partly because their mind, like other animal minds, has been programmed by evolution not for truth but for survival. I mean, it may be able partially to correct this, as it were, but essentially our minds are program programmed by evolution to fit the narrow conditions of the cosmos in which we find ourselves. They're not necessarily, not, not kind of, haven't evolved in order to understand the cosmos as a whole. If there is a whole, there may not be a whole. So uh, if you started with these, kind of, with an a genuinely Darwinian view, you wouldn't think in, the, in terms of um, the, mind, the human mind ever becoming infinite, and you wouldn't think of the human mind ever becoming immortal. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even have that object. And yet, as we sit and speak here now, um, uh, in the cathedral, there are people at Google, including uh, um, uh, a man called uh, Kurzweil, who is uh, uh, a director of, um, Ray Kurzweil, who's director of um, engineering at Google, who's working on not a, human longevity, not extending human lifespan, but on how humans can transcend death, how humans can transcend their contingent, accidental, flawed and mortal organic shell. In other words, he has the idea which he gets, I think, from 
the Hellenistic uh, monotheism that triumphed in the West. Um, not much of like that in Jesus' original, nothing in fact, uh, a teaching, but it, that's what many people think of when they think of um, uh, a monotheistic conception of the human being, which is that the humans have, so to speak, uh, in them, the essence of them, is an immortal mind or an immortal soul. Um, and so if you could somehow, and that's what survives in um, many uh, uh, Christian traditions. If you Not, could upload that onto the internet, as it were, yes. then you would have achieved immortality. Then it would survive forever, but of course it wouldn't survive forever if you think that the internet, as I do, uh, think, and anyone who actually, if anyone was a materialist, they would think this, they would think that the, the projections of the internet would only survive as long as the f physical infrastructure of the internet survived. So if a war or an economic crash or a, uh, some cataclysm, climate change, destroyed it or damaged it, then these uploaded souls of um, uh, Kurzweil and others would suddenly be snuffed out. Yeah. The other thing about that is that, strangely enough, the assumption is that this is somehow a good thing. Yes. Uh, whereas, yes. you know, if this is something which is created by people, by people, yes. people moreover, my, mired in the imperfections of yes. the old world, how you're then ever going to get towards a good sort of paradisiac yes. world where well, these souls are somehow uploaded. Well, I, uh, I mean, 20 years or so ago, I wrote that um, um, the cyber world, cyberspace, was a zone of war. Why is it a zone of war? Because cyberspace doesn't take anyone out of the human world. It's a projection of the human world. And the human world um, is uh, at war with itself. Maybe it's always been, but particularly so now with these high... Uh, new, new technology. So one can expect that the conflicts of the human world will be projected into cyberspace, as they are now. I was going to say, this is of course what we see now with political yes. uh, divisions, uh, with yes. you know, the worst kinds of pornography and so yes. on being yes. freely available. And the worst on, kinds on of racism internet. and the worst kinds of yes, anti-Semitism. That, the right. They're all there, as well as more explicit attempts at warfare by shutting down banks or shutting down... Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, power stations and uh, in other words it's, uh, the cyberspace has, has proved to be a kind of just a, a slightly distorted mirror of the human world so it, you, whereas it, when you read many of these um, thinkers it, it's as if cyberspace was a kind of um, te techno version of a platonic uh, uh, realm of forms. Realm of forms. And the realm of forms, of course, all in the end are forms of the good and the form of the, is the form of the truth. They all, they all inhere in each other and become one. In other words, they became like the rather platonized Christian God became, logos, one, reason and so on. But the actuality is very different. The actuality is of warfare, warfare in the cyber world all over the place. Mm. I, I'm skipping the, the, another version of atheism, yes. which is a, atheist political religions, yes. which is uh, Bolshev, Bolshevism and Jacobinism and so on. There's a lot of it in about that. Yes. I want to move on to what you call the gold haters. Yes. Uh, and there's an interesting sentence in your book where you say, you look at the Marquis de Sade, mm. uh, for example, to whom we owe the word sadism. Mm. Uh, so this is around mm. 1800, I think Sade was born 1740, died 1816, mm. thereabouts. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and he said, Sard is essentially religious. Can you mm. explain that? Well, <clears throat> if it would be reasonable if you asked someone what, is, what, was the, what was the Marquis de Sade really concerned or obsessed with, they would either say sex or they would say cruelty, or cruel sex, even, uh, because that's how his name has been inherited. But actually, if you look at his writings, they're immensely lengthy and mostly pretty boring. The sex and the cruelty that occurs to them are sort of incidents between enormously long sermon-like discourses of 40 or 50 or yeah. even 100 pages. That's a, this is an anecdote, but it's a wonderful little anecdote in one of Umberto Eco's uh, early books, which is called Misreadings, where he pretends to be a reader working for a publishing house and he, in, he, uh, he reads famous manuscripts and then he contacts the authors and tells them whether mm. their book can be published or not. And uh, he... Uh, 
he then reads uh, Justine by de Sade mm. and he sends it back saying, uh, dear Monsieur de Sade, I'm f uh, unfortunately this, this will never do. What <laughs> I read is I'm interested in is sex, sex and more sex. And instead you're giving them all these philosophical reflections. Yes. I'm afraid this is unpublished. <laughs> Quite. Uh, it would be maybe 10% sex <laughs> and 90% phil philosophy. And of the philosophy, 100% of philosophy would be anti would be atheistic and anti anti God, anti religious. Mm. So his I but think But how his, is it still also religious? Well his monomania was uh, um, um, based on his hatred of the of the Christian God which penetrated all of his writings and even shaped his conception of nature. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like many philosophers in France at his in his day and before and after his day he, re he replaced any notion of a divinely created or governed natural order with the idea that nature was uh, self-sustaining, freestanding. Um, now in pretty well all of them, and this is, except the Marquis de Sade, and this is what makes the Marquis de Sade an original thinker, not his boring sermons and his boring orgies and so on, but what's interesting and original in him is that he does that, he says, nature is nature, we're all caught up in nature, we're all natural, that's all there is. It's a classical atheist position, nature is there, but unlike his uh, other atheist philosophers who were writing at the time and before and after, he doesn't say if we go back to nature, if we shake off the corruptions of civilization and become more natural, we'll be better. He says nature is a realm of perpetual predation, of murder, of cannibalism, of um, uh, um, masquerades and deceits and um, it's, it's completely at least amoral but even perhaps immoral because he said he found in himself that when he consulted his natural impulses he got the greatest excitement the greatest pleasure from destruction from cruelty now where did that come from he said nature implanted that in that in me that came so he thought of he made nature female um, he said, nature, she implanted that in me, and I'm going to obey that in my life, although I hate nature, although I hate, uh, he hated the, the God he'd invented, the, na the natural goddess of nature, in the way, in exactly the same way, actually, that he hated God himself, if I can use the old, the old Christian God, and for the same reason, they, um, um, they on the one hand, they sort of explained the divisions in him, in that he uh, uh, um, had these impulses which sometimes he tried to su suppress partly when he was, it doesn't seem to have been influenced by Christianity much actually, even though he was brought up as a Catholic, and partly he identifies himself. It explains, as it were, his nature, and he says, what I'm going to do, the way I resolve this conflict, which in effect, in effect is a kind of atheist version of the problem of evil, I find these is I'm going to identify with, with, with the evil. I'm going to identify with the destruction as far as I can. I'm going to invent fictional characters who um, delight in plagues and uh, terrible wars and torture and cruelty and inflicting horrors on the weak and the poor. They delight in this. Um, partly because it's natural and partly because nature's implanted them pleasure and cruelty. It's natural. So that's a very interesting and radical turn of thinking. Uh, uh, um, at the time and wasn't really followed up until uh, by anyone till the end of the um, 20th century or the middle and the end of the 20th century in France and elsewhere. And so um, um, he was a religious monomaniac, not a sexual or a sadistic monomaniac at bottom, I think, uh, because he, all of his uh, long sermons and even his descriptions of torture and murder and so forth, were intended by him to illustrate the central point of his thinking, which is that human beings were impelled to do what they do by an amoral or immoral, an evil natural order. Um, and that's original. That's a very original uh, thought. It wasn't followed up much mm. later on. At the same time, you, you make the interesting and I think important observation that uh, if you look around you, yes, you see death and destruction mm. and cruelty and mm. so on uh, among all people and among all peoples, but you also see religion among all people yes. and amongst all peoples. And morality. So, <laughs> and morality. So that seems to yes. be natu natural too. Equally so natural. So Sard's idea that that is actually unnatural yes. 
is, uh, is kind of illogical. It's illogical and groundless. I mean, if what's natural is what human beings do, then what they do is they have religions. So as I find the, you know, the, the modern type of atheism puzzling because they're attacking what seems to be a, a deeply human natural characteristic. Have we ever found a culture, has one ever existed, in which there were no rituals, no myths, no stories, no practices that we recognize as religion? We've never found one before. So it's like attacking laughter or um, language even. This is just the way humans are. But that was a sort of contradiction in the thought of, um, not only of uh, de Sade, but of that uh, type of humanism that existed in Europe in the 18th century, which would say, we've got to be natural. It goes all the way back, actually, to uh, Lucretius and Epicuri uh, Epicurus, the um, ancient uh, uh, philosophers and thinkers, which say, we've got to be natural. But they say, well, what is nature? Well, it's what happens in the world. Well, in that case, all these things that you hate, like uh, uh, religion and prayer and uh, uh, morality and decency and... Uh, uh, they're all natural, because they're just what human beings do. So when Sad says marriage is unnatural, the bonds of marriage, or for romantic love even is unnatural, he said, because by, it limits the pleasure of those. He said, well, yes, but it was, who invented it? God? <laughs> There's no God to... So, by the way, there is a, so of course, what this is called often to Sad's way of thinking is mesothe mesotheism. And people say, they've even said against what I write that about it, they say, well, but that's contradictory because they're atheists. Well, the contradiction isn't in me, it's in these thinkers I'm talking about. They're atheists, they think there's no God. Um, William Empson was a mesotheist. Mm. Uh, he wrote a book on Milton in which he says that uh, the Christian idea of God is the worst thing the dark human heart has ever invented. It's intrinsically evil, he says. Well, strong words. Um, but um, uh, the paradox is, the con or contradiction is not in me, it's in him. He spends his life, as de Sade did in a different way, obsessed by a concept which he thinks is completely illusory, to which nothing corresponds. Now, that's not the only type of atheism. I give a different example. The Italian poet Leopardi, although brought up as a Catholic, um, early 19th century poet, was an atheist, and he said there was only nature. Um, there was nothing there, but he wasn't obsessed by it. Christian idea of God. He, he thought that nature was completely impersonal and so on. But he said, for him, the response uh, it, it brought forward from him was compassion for the human species. The human species couldn't help doing what it did. It, it was mechanical, it wasn't evil. Mm -hmm. And he said, maybe one could rebel against nature, or maybe, but maybe one could uh, complain in a sense, but you wouldn't see it as a sort of uh, uh, an evil agent implanting evil desires, just the way things are. So, to my mind, I know this sounds odd, given that I think there are lots of different kinds of atheism, but Leopardi's is a truer atheism in the sense than de Sade's or Empson's, in the sense that having distanced itself from these monotheistic conceptions, the conception of a Christian God, for example, uh, uh, and the problems of evil that that traditionally creates, did God create the evils in the world, why did he do it, etc., he just puts those on one side and leaves them behind says all there is is nature, what sort of attitudes shall I adopt towards it? That seems to me truer, in the, if, you, if you start as an atheist, than carrying on the Christian framework, the Christian scaffolding, and using it to erect some new structure, whether of history or science, or um, uh, of God itself. Yeah. Uh, just one quick remark, not only, of course, is the definition of uh, nature that uh, Saad puts forward problematic. The whole idea that we should return to nature yeah. is contradictory in itself because the idea that we should return to nature is a stance taken within culture. Yes. Um, and anyway, but leave that I've, to one. Well, the way I put it is that if you think about, I mean, which is, you would think you could say that something that we from within culture would describe as within culture, would describe as, as uh, um, civilization is natural for human beings. Evidently, where did the civilization come from? But so is barbarism, which is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is natural. They're both, yeah. It's all natural. Yeah. So the two uh, types of atheism that are left, and I think they are the ones that you are attracted mm. to, are atheism without progress mm. and the atheis atheism of silence. Mm. Could you see, say a little bit more about those two? Mm. Well, an atheism without progress, which I find in a variety of thinkers among philosophers, the little red now, but I think very interesting philosopher, 
Spanish-American philosopher, George Santillana, who um, died in, uh, I think, 1952, at the age of about 90. Um, he's a modern exponent of it. Among writers, you find, uh, I think Joseph Conrad was a, mm -hmm. a writer who held to this view, is the view that um, um, there is no collective agent of humanity mimicking the Christian God and uh, progressing throughout history. There are just human beings, lots of different uh, uh, um, human beings in the world. And there's no um, progress. In Santayana, this, this is a, basically he revives a kind of uh, uh, pre-Christian view in which um, there is such a thing as human civilization. He's not a total relativist. Um, uh, but it has different kinds and types. There are many different versions of it. And they rise and fall. And history as a whole shows no tendency to um, uh, improvement as between different civilizations. In fact, um, there is an element of relativism in this because he says you can only really have cumulative advance within a civilization. I mean, it determines what that advance consists in. In Conrad, uh, who of course, unlike many of the other I think as I discuss, maybe the sound was different. He kind of had a very interesting life. He didn't spend it in his uh, study. He was a, uh, a sailor for over 20 years and had many uh, uh, difficult encounters in that, in, that, in that period. Conrad thought of his atheism was intimately connected uh, with, his, with his conception that there was no progress because his atheism removing apparently without any nostalgia um, uh, any idea of a creator god or a god interested in human beings or he left that aside. So there were only human beings connected by work and uh, friendship and solidarity but in another ways rather um, solitary. And he thought that the best things in human beings were exhibited when they came up against um, circumstances and situations which were irremediable. In other words, the best thing wasn't the capacity for him. The best things in humans didn't come from an, um, um, gradual improvement in their own condition. They came from an encounter, encounter with a civilization that could not be improved at all, and which perhaps were bad in the disaster, like the ship sinking. How, do, how does a human being respond to that? Well, if a human being responds to that by being brave, by being courageous, by, being, by helping other human beings as far as possible, then Conrad admired that. So his, his atheism was sort of essentially, in a way, almost grounded in non-progress. There wasn't much uh, progress. If any. It's not hopeless, though, is it? Because there's, no. there's still values. The values are the values inherent in these human responses to the world. I mean, some people would say it was hopeless, but that's because they're hooked on a hope of a kind of continuous narrative of improvement or redemption in nature. An interesting example of the difference between um, uh, Conrad and modern humanists or modern atheists is it brought out in his wonderful exchange of letters with Bertrand Russell, mm -hmm. uh, who called his son, by the way, um, uh, after Conrad, Conrad Russell, Lord Russell, because he sort of fell in love with Russell. He writes about it in terms of, I mean, he fell in love with Conrad. Russell fell in love with God. And, uh, but uh, he writes about it in exactly those terms, uh, he says. It was like, like romantic love. But what he had in common with Conrad was the idea that human civilization was very thin, it could easily crack, and there could be a kind of descent into, into barbarism. Where he differed from Conrad was that he uh, believed that by the use of um, human knowledge and advancing human uh, understanding, that uh, barbarism could put, be put further and further in the, in, in the past, and, hu and the human uh, situation could, be, could improve. And so he shares various letters with Conrad, and Conrad just writes, well, this is just to me all complete nonsense. So he says, human beings are like a fly crawling up and down on a windows pane. Um, uh, or they fly, and that looks magnificent, but it's rather ugly. The really valuable things for Conrad, so there's no hope there, that's for sure. But it doesn't mean you, it's hopeless uh, in general because what Conrad admired and even loved were the uh, evidences, which were many in his life, um, 
of human beings um, asserting themselves, if you like, against their fate, showing valor, showing, showing courage to those to the, uh, for themselves and those they loved and so on, in situations that were not fully controllable by them and not remediable by them. So it's a very, it's, if you like, it's more like certain aspects of um, Greek, not in, not in kind of terms of Greek philosophy, but more like Greek drama. That was an admirable way of dealing with, you could say. Still, he still or she a, couldn't get out of the situation. There's still a strong criticism of, 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 of social injustice as well, though, isn't there? Very much is, so, is, yes. Isn't there? Well, he was, remember, the, Conrad... I he, mean, colonialism, for example. I mean, people yeah. have argued, probably rightly, that in some senses he remained stuck in, certain, mm. in a certain colonial outlook, but then who didn't at the time. But his, his, his critique of colonialism is very strong. And not many people were as um, radical and as... Um, um, unforgiving. And unforgiving of imperialism he was because he went and saw it in the Congo. Mm, yes. And in fact he wrote, I think in one of his beautiful paradoxes, he said, before I went to the Congo I was a savage. It was only when I saw what he meant, he, he was civilised. <laughs> I thought he was civilised, he was a civilised savage. When I went to the Congo, and he wrote a diary of it, um, uh, which can be read today, um, uh, he saw the worst kind of um, predation and barbarism perpetrated under the auspices of an idea of progress. In fact, the, the organization that King Leopold, the Congo at that time was his, per, Leopold's personal fiefdom, was, an, was a, 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 a kind of killed a significant section of the population, maybe about 20%, enslaved others, and did many, many terrible things. It was called, I think, the, uh, the Commission or the Organization for Progress and Civilization. So um, Conrad, of course, has been criticised, but uh, actually there's practically no one, I think, at that time writing in Europe, certainly not Marx, who praised British imperialism in India. Um, uh, there's practically no one who writes with such depth of um, horror yeah. and condemnation of, of that kind of... But of course, why... And there's an important aspect there, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Uh, you bring this out uh, in your review of, of mm. Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker, mm. that uh, you know that idea of the mission civilisatrice mm. comes to a large extent out of the Enlightenment. Yes, it does. And again, uh, people, of course, people redefine the Enlightenment to mean what they like. So if one says, as I have said, well, Lenin was an Enlightenment thinker and practitioner. No, he wasn't because he killed lots of people. Well, he, he said he was, and he said he was copying the Jacobins. They thought they were implementing No, they weren't. So who do you end up with? I mean, uh, um, you end up with some sort of Thomas Paine or uh, you end up with some sort of scattered few liberals. Uh, uh, I mean, the Enlightenment is, 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 is a big intellectual movement. It had various different strands. Some were liberal, some were anti-liberal. Comte was anti-liberal, not just non-liberal. He hated liberal individualism. He wanted something like the, the Christian Middle Ages, but without religion. Um, um, he said that explicitly many times. And by the way, one of the people that Comte inspired was uh, Morin, the uh, uh, um, intellectual, Charles Morin, the intellectual um, um, founder of Action Francaise, the fascist group. And um, uh, Morin said, what I want is to fuse uh, uh, Comte with Demestre, the great um, Catholic religious thing, he began to say, we find in Comte a kind of modern, and more I was an atheist himself. We want to, f we want to fuse these, this anti-liberal, anti-individualist, anti, anti, anti uh, totally against modern secular humanism, with um, liberal humanism, uh, with uh, Comte scientific um, um, uh, uh, contributions. Finally, the atheism of silence. Let's it's talk, one I like talk about that if one can. <laughs> if one can. It'd be better to be silent about it, but this is an interview, so I'll try and say... Um, tr uh, I mean, I actually say that some of the, the best expressions of the atheism of silence are not in philosophy, but as Schopenhauer himself, one of the philosophers of the atheism of silence, in music. I mean, uh, or in, um, um, if in language, in poetry or in ritual, uh, the kind of rituals that uh, religious practitioners um, engage in. And the atheism of silence, uh, most, you might say, systematically worked out in uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, early, 20th century, early 19th century German philosopher, 
and later in one um, uh, uh, and, and later in um, uh, Fritz Mautner, a much less well-known philosophical writer who's m managed to actually be remembered in the history of philosophy only because Wittgenstein de devotes a single dismissive sentence to him in the Tractatus. Um, saying, um, this is what I think, it sounds like Mautner, but it isn't really, it's nothing to do with Mautner. Uh, but he wrote a five-volume history of atheism. He was himself an atheist. Four volume, I think. Four, you're right. Four volume, you're quite right. A history of atheism, in which he says the uh, the, the 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 culmination of atheism is in a view in which um, the world itself is inevitable, cannot be captured by language, um, uh, and he's what traditionally was sometimes called a nominalist, a radical nominalist, that's to say general terms, general ideas, should never be taken as realities. If you're a nominalist, they should be taken as useful tools, but you shouldn't get hung up on them. And that, of course, applies for him being an atheist to God. Uh, and it also applies to humanity and justice and all these post-Christian ideals that people believe in and subscribe to. So, he, so um, uh, what's then left? Well, the interesting point there at which, as I've said in my book, um, uh, atheism um, comes close to a kind of radical type of mysticism, uh, or if you like, what's called within uh, Christianity, apophatic theology is the theology which says, you can't say anything about God because God transcends you. Can't yeah, say neg negative maybe. theology. You can't even say that God exists, maybe. Yeah. You can't even say that. So um, the idea God is neither created nor not created. Yeah, and yes, he yes. neither exists nor does he not no, exist. He exists, you can't say so anything. He's beyond comprehension. Any, in, be, yeah. Which is very strong in um, Orthodox traditions, Greek and Russian Orthodox traditions. Um, uh, but there is also apophatic theology in Western Christianity. For example, uh, even Aquinas says um, God exists, but not in the way that any particular thing exists, or that in a way that we can understand. God exists in some other different way. Um, so there's a kind of convergence there between apophatic theology or radical mysticism and the ultra skepticism if you, of um, a thinker like um, a writer like uh, Mountain or Schopenhauer, because Schopenhauer says at the end of the, what can we sort of say about uh, the mystical reality that he thinks in some sense exists, though even to say, he said nothing, we can't say anything, you actually say absolutely nothing. Um, well, how is it then valuable and how is it then intimated in human experience? Well, Schopenhauer says um, it's intimated in human experience through basically experiences of beauty. And what experiences of beauty have in common, he thinks, is that they release us from the self, which is an illusion. So uh, what, um, and, and in music, he thinks that uh, the same thing happens. Um, so uh, for Schopenhauer, we get closer to a reality which cannot be spoken um, through these um, human experiences of, uh, of, of uh, beauty and music. And, and maybe he would also say, because he was quite sympathetic to Indian religion, Hinduism mm. and Buddhism, um, through certain types of contemplative practice. He was very hostile, actually, on the whole, to Christianity um, uh, for a, a variety of uh, reasons. But these other religious, these atheist religions, as I call them in my book, because they're, they're definitely religions on any understanding of them, uh, but they don't have any idea, uh, particularly in Buddhism, and no idea at all of a, of a creator God, or even of a soul, a separate soul. They explicitly reject mm. those ideas. Um, uh, uh, he's very, he's very um, Schopenhauer is very uh, sympathetic to, to that kind of, kind of uh, now there are problems with that uh, view. He didn't himself live according to that philosophy at all. Uh, he cultivated the pleasures of a, uh, a bachelor with a private income once he managed to obtain a private income. Yeah, it was very much a relaxed, pleasure-seeking kind of guy. I wouldn't say relaxed. I think he was quite anxious person. You think? Yes, yes. I think he, I th I think he well, for example, he, he always drank from the same vessel which he took around with him because he thought if he used um, vessels in restaurants, he might get the plague. <laughs> that was a bit odd. So I think he, he, he had a streak of anxiety in him. But he aimed to, um, he aimed to conquer it by pleasure, sensual pleasure, sexual. He wrote a sexual diary which was burnt after he died, we just, so we don't know what's in it. Uh, but he also wrote 
famous chapters on sexuality in mm. which influenced Freud and so on through music. He kept a succession of animal companions, um, and he and he stuck to habit routine. He had very strict um, uh, routine. So he certainly didn't live in a selfless way. Quite the contrary. Um, um, but um, he uh, points, if you like, to um, a form of life which uh, at least contains these uh, selfless, ex these egoless experiences, which he thinks, and again, the later Nietzsche, I mean, not everyone would agree with this, but he thinks of aesthetic experiences, essentially experience which um, abolishes or loosens the uh, bonds of the ego. So, that, so, so what, <clears throat> I mean, I end my discussion of atheism and religion by saying that a, um, uh, if you think of uh, God in this way, not as the creator of the world, not as something that exists or doesn't exist, um, but as a kind of um, a nameless, un an unnameable um, a reality of some kind. And the difference between a world that's entirely godless and one that, in some sense, is suffused with divinity may be hard to tell. So there is a kind of, um, uh, it may be hard to mark that boundary. There may be the difference between um, uh, the most radical type of atheism and the kind of um, what I've called um, the atheism of silence on the one hand, and on the other hand, some kind of mystic mystical affirm may be uh, very hard to, to mark. And so um, that, I think, is a, a real kind of atheism um, because it, it, it dispenses with the idea. It's also, by the way, you find it in the history of um, religion. Uh, Meister Eckhart, the uh, 13th century um, uh, German mystic, used to pray, oh God, rid me of the idea of God, which is rather nice. Um, I think that's a very good note to end, 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 end on the, the realization that atheism in its most radical form might actually be shading into some kind of theism or mysticism and that therefore the difference between atheism and believing is a lot smaller than many people believe. Exactly. Thank you for doing this interview. Thank you very much, Hank. <laughs>